for the presentation. My name is Mike, and this is all about finding deals in today's market. Every market is different. Every area is different. And uh, the, the market I'm talking about today is the Worcester market. What I mean by Worcester is Worcester and the towns that surround Worcester. I'm an investor. I run about 46 units right now. Uh, 40 of which are mine, and the other six are managed. And I'm a property manager as well. Uh, but I started scaling back and taking other people's properties, so I'm not really looking for that right now. I just got a bigger portfolio. Um, but all I really know about is Worcester. I can't tell you about Brookline. I can't tell you about the Cape Cod area. I can't tell you about the South Shore. I don't know any of that. All I know is one area, and I suggest to anybody getting into this that you pick an area and you focus on it. Because if you do that, you'll build your people here or wherever it may be. Your contractors, your lawyers, your, uh, I don't know, all your vendors, basically. Every time you have a problem with a property, if you've got one in Fall River and one in, uh, I don't know, Lawrence, the same contractors are going to go take care of those two properties. It's really hard to find those guys. So I'm a strong believer in keeping things within an area. And Worcester happens to be my area. I guess one more. All right. So in order to find the best deals, there's a few things you'll need to, to keep in mind. The first and most important one is you have to be ready. If you're a new investor, you're starting out, and you're out there looking at properties, you have your finances sorted out, you don't know what the criteria is, you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know what you're looking at, you're really not gonna be successful. Or you, you may be, but by sheer luck, you're, you're gonna have a much harder time if you don't prepare. The next point is that once you are ready, and we're going we're to touch on all these topics in a little bit more detail on future slides, but I'm just breaking it down right now. Once you are ready, the second a good deal, or what looks like a good deal, comes to market, comes to you off market, however you get it, you have to jump on it immediately. Because if you don't, somebody else will, and it'll be gone. If you're not fast, you're not getting the deals. You have to have a great team. You may be a real estate agent, you may be a mortgage broker, you may be an attorney, but you need everybody. You need a, you need a, most importantly, you need a good broker or agent, whatever, whatever it may be. I, I use the word broker, I probably should say agent. But uh, you need a good agent, a good lender, a good attorney, unless you get cash in the bank, then forget the lender. Um, and there's definitely more people you want on your team, but these are the key people to get a deal done with you. You also have to have good support tools. Um, there's the MLS, there's Zillow, there's biggerpockets.com. You guys can get on there and learn a lot about investing. I think that's one of the best free resources there is. Uh, there's also paid versions of bigger pockets, but um, and I do pay for it, but I happen to be in this world. So but Mike, you also feel that sometimes the things on bigger pockets may be more representative of West Coast properties made up of fully uh, translatable to our market space? No, I think a lot of the rules and teachings that they have apply anywhere. Okay. You can probably go to Thailand and, uh, and apply those teachings. I love this. A lot of them are about formulations for what's a good deal. And okay. Obviously, you have to convert currency if you're out of the country, but I, th I think it makes sense anywhere because math is there. Yep. The math may be better in Midwest Ohio or whatever, where like I mean, you get five, 500 caps. I don't know. What's the story? <laughs> Oh, my. All right. So I broke it down into steps. Um, step one is lineup financing. I think we touched on that briefly, but basically there's, there's a lot of different financing types. And I think the next slide is all about that. But, and we will get into that in more detail. The next thing you have to do is decide exactly what you want. You have to set the standards for the property with your agent and receive automatic listing updates by emails. I can provide it to you, yeah, just, just email. I'll send it to you. Um, and my contact info is on the end of this, including my email address. But decide what you want. I, I can't drive that point home enough. You have to really know what you're looking for. I want an investment property that isn't good enough. I want a three-decker that makes $340 plus per door. That's a good enough um, thing, right? I, I, or I want 20 plus units in a single standalone building um, with parking, for example, right? That's really specific. You have to know what, what kind of returns you're looking for. But 
Because if, if you just think I want a three decker and you go out and you pay six hundred thousand dollars for a three decker in Vernon Street in Worcester, you're a sucker, wow. right? And we don't want to be suckers, so we got to know exactly what we're looking for and and get that. <coughs> uh, the next one is you got to move on. You got to set appointments to see properties as soon as you think it's a good deal. Um, in some cases, you offer on it blind if you can't get in there, right? There's there's a lot of different techniques you can do. Some people will go and they'll go and you know, they'll take their agent and use them for that lack of a better word, and they'll say, hey, send out 20 lowballs, right? To all the properties on the market. <clears throat> and they'll do that and they may actually hit one. It, it works. The more aggressive you are in real estate, the more, more attempts you're making at getting a deal done, the better off you're gonna be. And the, the more likely it is you're gonna get that deal. Um, once you get something under contract, you have to do your due diligence, which we're gonna break that down in a bit more on a future slide as well. This is just a general overview. Um, and once you've determined through your due diligence that it's a good property, that there's not some major outstanding problems like uh, pending lawsuits or board of health violations or, or, or you know major issues, condemned building. Foundation issues, which is common. Foundation issues, yeah, they can be pretty major, structural stuff too, and some people miss that. Now that's, that's major for some people and minor for others. Yeah. Um, but for most people, I'd say structural and foundation is pretty major. Yeah. Um, once you've determined that's a good deal, you buy the property. Um, and that we're gonna break down as well. And then you gotta repeat, right? If, if you're here and you just want one property, that's easy enough, you'll eventually find that. Um, do it again and again. I, I recommend everybody here set goals and know what you want. Look at, the, look at the future, right? If you don't know where you wanna be in five years, in 10 years, <coughs> or in 20 years, you, you're not gonna ever, get anything. If you just say, I want to build my portfolio, that's not that's not specific enough. There's nothing to work towards, and you're not going to know when you've met your goals. All right. So lining up financing. There's a few ways to finance a property. And I have opinions on which ways are better and which ways are worse. And the reality is, it's usually specific to the person that's buying the property. Um, for example, most people in this room don't have cash to just buy a house, right? But if you do, that's likely your best option because you're gonna be able to negotiate pretty hard, you'll be able to close pretty quick, um, you're gonna be in a really good position if you have $300,000 to buy a three decade model, right? Um, the option that a lot of you are probably gonna be looking at is buying a conventional or with an FHA loan. Now, with those types of loans, you can put down three and a half to 5% depending on the loan type, if you're willing to live in the building, or say you're gonna live in the building. <laughs> and by a building that's compliant. And by a building that's compliant. Yeah, there's certain criteria that the building must meet or have. Um, it's gotta be, you know, for FHA and VA, for example, are a lot pickier than conventional lenders. So there's different criteria um, and different buildings that qualify. So it's only for if you are a personal home buyer, right? That is not accurate. No. Not accurate? You okay. can do FHAs over and over again. There are certain programs like mass housing, okay. which are two states one only. Um, and those programs are usually better than like an FHA. And even for those programs, if you're a first time home buyer and you haven't bought a house in three years. They reverse your own house. They 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 start you back over again. You could own 80 properties, sell them all, and now you you haven't had anything in three years. You're a first time home buyer for them. Um, and then some of these loan uh, programs like Home Possible, you can you can use that after you've used in mass housing. So there's a lot of complicated different ways you can get multiple conventional low down payment uh, homes. Now. I think we're gonna break this down a bit more, but the best terms you're gonna get on a loan are with conventional or FHA, conventional first. Um, you're gonna get the lowest interest rate, the longest amortization, and the rates are gonna be locked typically. Um, the next one is buy with a commercial loan. In my opinion, that's one of the better ways to go if you're an investor. It's not as much of a pain in the ass to deal with as an FHA or a conventional. It's, um, it's way less paperwork, it really is. Uh, it's a quicker process, and it's it's more asset based. But you'll get much better terms than you will with like a hard money, which is where we're going next. I think I missed hard money actually. Um, no, I totally missed it. 
This fourth one is a combination. Combination, yeah, but I, I skipped one. What are the commercial loans? Is that, can that be any property? Does that have to be like five plus units? So a commercial loan can be on any property. I have commercial loans on yeah, standalone office products. buildings. I have commercial LLC. loans on commercial single families. Commercial defraud their product. Yeah. Okay. Confusing. Usually. There's a I lot of confusion around that. It yeah. really is. So I probably should have cleared that up, but um, yeah, I have commercial loans on three acres, on two families, on single families, on, on six families, on nine units. I have commercial loans all over the place. And for the most part, in my opinion, best case scenario, commercial loan, uh, way better than an conventional or FHA, but that's for me. For some other people, that's not the case. Um, and then the last, the, the next one, which I should have mentioned, and I, I think we skipped it somehow, maybe it got out, got lost. Why is it better for you? Why is it better for me? It's quick, it's easy. Um, the interest rates are just about the same. And it puts me in a much better position to negotiate when I'm buying property. And I typically don't go straight into a commercial loan anyway. I typically refinance a commercial loan. There's, there's one more. Uh, you can only get so many conventional mortgages before banks stop lending to you. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. up to 10 if you're lucky. And then they won't lend you with a conventional loan. So yeah. you, you can have like a, what's called a portfolio loan, right? That's so you have a portfolio loan. A portfolio loan is a term used for a loan that's held by the bank and serviced by the bank. Exactly. So if you have like, say, 40 units, it's only like three, one, three, you know, like four, you know, you have that on for a loan. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Commercial loans, like my bank specifically said, yeah, you can borrow up to twenty million for building. That all comes out of relationships, right? Commercial loans is such a oh, it really is, yeah. yeah. And and you start small with them, and then they they up your 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 ante and so on. And if I hit the twenty million cap, guess what? They're probably gonna increase it. But if they don't, you just move on to another bank, and they give you a twenty million cap. On, on the commercial loan, they're not really so. <laughs> fixated on the quality or condition of the building, is that correct? They're not very picky, no. They yeah. do do appraisals, which is a bit of a pain in the ass, but I think but most lenders- But that's appraise, but they're not gonna get the subtle nuance. Yeah, they'll give you typically 75% of the appraisal. appraisal. I think I break this down in a future slide. I'm trying to remember all that. Um, but the next one I wanna talk about is hard and private money. Um, hard money and private money is basically the same thing. The source is the only difference, and they're lent based on the hard asset. Does everybody here know what a hard money loan is? Yeah? Okay, I'll just go through it pretty briefly anyway. Basically, it's, it's, it's a loan that's typically somewhere between 10 and 14% interest, typically two to four points in. Um, it's very expensive money, but it's very quick. It's typically short term, it's typically interest only. Um, and by short term, I mean a year or less typically interest only, and it's not meant to be long term financing. It's meant to get the property but bought and then usually into a condition where it can be either resold or refinanced. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Can the hard money be lent to a person or does it have to be a hand? So a hard money lender, and the rules are different for everyone, especially the private lenders. When you've got some guy named Bob that wants to lend money, he makes his own rules, right? Um, but typically on the hard money loans, side, they'll want to lend to an LLC or a trust, an entry, not a person. Mm -hmm. uh, the private lender's a little more flexible about that, typically. But again, it's lender by lender. I'm sure there's hard money lenders out there that would lend to you and your name. Well, you have to sign documents to make, uh, stating that you'll never live in the property, never move in, you won't get a homestead, you'll probably have to have a spousal waiver with your hard money lender. There's, there's a lot to it. Got a question? I have spoken to three banks, I mean, it's very hard to get a commercial loan if you want to fix, uh, you want to buy, fix, and then rent. They say it's been, you go to them when you're ready to rent, but it's- You go to them after you've rented it. Generally. Yes. That's when the that's they say if, it's, if, it's, if you're going to fix it, if they're going to do it, it's gonna take it. You're gonna spend a lot of money because they have people inspecting it at every level, and approving the loan can take a long time. Oh, like a construction type loan? Yes. Yeah, yeah. If, if you, need, if you okay. need to buy a property that's in poor condition, it needs work, needs tenants, my suggestion would usually be to go hard or private money, get the project done, get good tenants in there that are properly screened, get lead certificates, get all the stuff these banks are going to look for, then refinance the commercial. 
That is what I do in a lot of the cases. Conventional or commercial, whichever one you I'm sorry, have. not conventional, commercial. Yeah. I did not mean to say conventional. Get a word. Um, when you do the hard money loan and then you um, refinance before you have a mortgage at the end once you fix it up, do you still have to put down like a, a percentage of your own capital? So you have to put down money when you bought it. You typically increase the value. You would say that the first part again? Sorry. You have to put down money when you bought it. Because if you go to a hard or private money lender, typically they're going to want at least 20% down on the asset cost. And they, they'll probably lend you 100% of the rehab, but that's in draws after you spend the money. Um, and then when you go to refinance these commercial lenders, a lot of them will have what's called loan to cost limitations, but they're pretty high. Your average commercial lender will have a 92% loan to cost limitation. What's that mean? That means if you spent half a million dollars, they will lend you up to 92% of half a million dollars or 75% of the appraised value, whichever is lower. So they have two caps. And whichever one's the lower cap, that's what they lend you. I use a lender, DCU, uh, they don't have loan to cost limitations. So sometimes I get back more money than I put into the property, which is pretty awesome. They're pretty much the only lender I know that does that. So would you use that if you use the patent on the lender to cover that difference, you would take that additional money and pay them back? So it comes the proceeds of the sale. When you refinance a property, you have to discharge the, the, the first mortgage. That first mortgage would be that private loan or that hard money loan. Okay. Um, and you, you can't close without clear title. That's right, because we close out one of my notes, right? So at the closing table, they're closing, I'm signing the discharge relief out of the, the closing apparatus. You're obviously going to get, you've already got an appraised, it's going to be more money than it's owed to me. So the spread's going to be yours. So the spread is at least 20% of this new uh, value that you have in the bank, and you're already in. Gotcha. And more than that, like he said, you get a check yourself while they are. Not very common. The reason that is not him is going to be bought really good. Um, it didn't waste a lot of money in the market. Can you say that a bit louder so everybody can hear you? Sorry. Right. Um, loan cost limitation. Right. Does that include the holding costs, the hard money costs, the capital costs? A loan to cost would be everything you've put in and spent on the building, yes. But it has to be documentable. Right. You have to be able to show them. If you're, if you're at that borderline, which typically the only way you get to that borderline is if you get a really good deal. Yeah. And you put in some work. And you put in good tenants. And you get good rents. Um, but if all that comes together well, yeah, they're going to want their own argumentation. They'll probably want your HUD from the purchase. They'll probably want some sort of breakdown. They don't need doc. They don't need receipts from Home Depot. They're going to ask you what your rehab budget was and what you spent the money on, right? You just break that down to them in an email in most cases, and they'll take your word for it. Um, but it has to be believable. You can't say I spent six hundred thousand dollars on a bathroom. They're not going to like that. <laughs> and. Uh, and I guess we really did touch on cash to commercial or hard slash private to commercial. That's one of my favorite. What is the point? When people put in offers and properties, if they've got hard money lending possibly lined up on the property, they can execute their offer as though it's a cash deal. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're going to talk something, about that. That's somewhat of a, a shield that a lot of guys use. Pretty sure on the next slide we're, we're talking about all that. Okay. So yeah, this is a little more of an explanation of the financing options. And I probably just went through exactly this, but now it's here on the screen. Um, cash on hand, always the best option, but it's not viable for everyone. There are ways to get cash out of credit cards or by taking equity out of your home or business. Does everybody understand what that means? So I'll give you an example, right? I, I hate Bank of America. I think they suck as a bank. Their credit cards are awesome. So in a position, in a, in a time where I'm cash light and I want to buy something, I can take money from my Bank of America credit cards at 0% interest for like 12 months, paying a 3% fee up front. So basically they'll take all that money that you request from them based on whatever your credit limit is. They'll put it in a bank account for you. Any bank account you tell, it could be at any bank. And then you can use that money to finance your next deal. But then you have credit card debt on your credit report. That may or may not matter for you, especially if you're doing hard money or private money. It doesn't matter at all because they typically don't care what your credit is. But when you go to refinance, they may check you, they may not. It depends on whether you built a relationship with them. Um, and there's plenty of other ways to get equity too. Take it out of your house, home equity loans, lines of credit, take it out of your business. Um, many different ways. There's, there's a lot of things. 
personal loans uh, from family members or from, uh, I don't know, those, 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 like, I don't remember the names of those companies, but there's a lot of companies yeah. out there that just do personal loans. They're a little bit high interest, but they do. And then you can use that as cash. You can really combine. Um, and then hard or private money. This is the easiest to obtain uh, other than cash if it's a good deal. But it's also the most expensive way to finance a property. If the property needs a lot of work, this may be your only option besides cash. So a lot of times you'll see a property that needs a bunch of work on the MLS or, or, or wherever it may be. You'll get an email from a wholesaler and they'll say, must be cash. If they say must be cash, you can still use hard or private money. They don't care. What they mean is there has to be some cash equivalent. The hard money is definitely a cash equivalent. Um, except for the fact that they do an appraisal. Usually it makes sense on those deals. Uh, commercial loans, these will typically require 25% down at purchase or 25% equity at refinance. So if you're buying a building and you want to go straight into it with commercial, typically it's got to be a decent building, running well, with tenants in place. Um, if it's not, you're going to have to buy it cash or private, fix it up, put good tenants in there, and then refinance commercial. And they'll typically give you 25%, uh, 75% of the appraised value of the property at the time you go to reapply. The new appraisal. Yeah, they'll send out an appraisal during that process. You have to pay for it up front, it's not cheap. Sometimes they're like 200 bucks for a two family, it's crazy. <laughs> 700 bucks, sorry. 700 bucks for a two family. <laughs> And then next is FHA, VA, conventional, that type of loan. There's a lot of other loans that fall into that category. There's mass housing, there's Freddie Mac Home Possible. There's a ton of them. You can probably pull up a list of 20 different loan products you can get that out there. But basically, these loans are meant for people that are gonna live in the property. Um, and they're very in-depth bank loans with a lot of rules, a lot of regulations, and be a real pain to go through the process. They also take the longest and put you in the weakest position negotiating. If you're selling a house as a, as a, as a landlord, you, you have three family you want to sell, or you sell a single family, and you have any kind of decent agent or any kind of experience, you'll, you'll know that if you see an FHA offer come through and you see a cash offer, you're not even considered the FHA offer, even if it's $25,000 more in most cases. Because those don't always close, and they're a real pain in the ass, and they ask for things. And the, the better quality, Financing you have, the better position you are to pay less money for the property. Cash is king. Cash is definitely king. Um, and then combination again, we talked about that on the last slide. You can you can combine these options to suit your needs. And uh, there are a lot of different techniques for that. I think we touched on it pretty good. All right. So now we're talking about your agent and your search for the house. Once you get all the financing figured out. You gotta find the property. A lot of you are probably gonna have to lean on an agent if you don't have a lot of time, if you don't have a lot of uh, connections, if you don't have the ability to do it yourself. Um, so once you've got the financing sorted out, your agent can find you the property. Your agent may also help you sort out the financing as well. If you have a good agent, they can, they'll have connections to lenders, they'll have connections to to lawyers, they'll have connections to everybody you need, in most cases. The right person. The next slide is talking about the right person. So make sure your agent has adequate experience as an agent and an investor. Ask them details about both. You want to make sure your agent owns the type of property you're looking to buy. If you're looking to get commercial warehouse buildings and they don't own a commercial warehouse, is they the wrong agent? I don't care how great they tell you they are. I don't care if they're running around buying single families all day long and selling single families all day long. They have to do what you're looking to buy. Once you get past four units, you then get into commercial as a classification of build, uh, building, right? So if you've got some agent that goes with those two or three families, that may or may not be the right agent for a 12 unit building. In fact, in most cases it's not because that's a different type of process. Um, um, and they, they have to have experience as an agent. They have to understand the transaction. If you got some guy that's brand new, got his license three weeks ago, wrong person for you. Even if it's your brother, they'll be very mad at you. If they're your brother, though, and, even more some, so. and, and you use some other agent, though. So you got to figure that out on your own. 
Okay, next, I'm gonna keep ramming this point home because it's very important that I figure out the criteria, what your criteria are for your property. Unit count, cap rate, location, budget. Um, do you guys all know what a cap rate is? Anybody have any idea? Do you, do you look at that when you look at oh God, two and three families? Yes. I know you're not supposed to. I get that. <laughs> I get that. But it's all financial for me. So if I'm looking at a two family, it has to perform. I don't care what the market pays. It has to perform. And uh, the, the better you get at this, the stricter you'll be on criteria like that. I know people say you're not supposed to use cap rate on a two family. I get that. <coughs> But if it doesn't return my money the same way a bigger building would, I don't want it. Can you explain? Okay, so cap rate is, is a term for a, a, a measure, a metric that a lot of people use to determine the value of a, a commercial property. And basically, it's your net operating income of the property, which is all the income minus all the expenses minus the, with, with the exception of the debt service. So if you get like $100,000 in rent a year in a property, right, and that's $60,000 in expenses, your NOI would be $40,000, net operating income, right? If you divide that into the purchase price, let's just use an example of a $400,000 purchase price and a $40,000 net operating income, right? That would be what's called a 10 cap, or a 10% capitalization rate. That's typically the point at which a deal starts to make sense, in my opinion, in Worcester. There are people that will tell you they'll take seven caps all day long, and there are people that want 16 caps. Usually, the boss in the area will take much lower. So they're very familiar with yeah. five. We don't have any good. Different markets have I do 18 to 19 for money. So, so, but, well, you need a tougher credit, tougher tenants. You're not getting the issue. Yeah, same yeah. building. I don't care. It's like, yeah. it's like a cultural yeah. issue. Five years, I'll have it all paid back. Yeah. yeah. That's so the cap rate can help you prepare, can help you figure out what the performance of your property should be. The cap rate can also help you negotiate, right? If they know it's a 10 cap market and they got it listed at an 8 cap, and you you talk to the agent and the seller and you say, hey, I did my math out here and some of your numbers are off and you're not going to take what you think the rent might be in your vacant units, we got to know what the actual cap rate is today at the moment. It'll help you negotiate down the price sometimes. If they're reasonable, lot, reasonable lot of people. Yeah, sometimes they don't care at all. They're different than all opinions. And then the, uh, once you figure out your criteria. Mike, the most important is if you're comfortable with the cap rate, who gives a shit if the guy is selling it? Oh, yeah. You know, so I mean, if your cap rate is 10% and you're not going to negotiate, you just walk on and say that. Right, but if I see someone performing at a bad cap rate, that's a target for me to try to acquire the property. Because obviously the guy's doing his arithmetic and saying, geez, everybody else is doing 18%, but I'm fucking up and getting 7%. Right. He may want to sell. Yeah. <laughs> we take that. Right, so we can turn that 7 and make it to 19 where yeah. it belongs. We offer him that solution right. to his And I price it out at a 7. So yeah. That's what he got. Yeah, there's a lot of metrics. Cash to cash is how much money you put in and how much money comes out. So if you put in $10,000, and in your first year you expect to take 20000 back, you get 200% cash on cash, right? <laughs> have one of those? Very doable. It business. really is. Yeah. Got to buy, right? uh, buy, buy, buy okay, actually, to do, yeah. do something like that. Cash on cash is, is important, um, and it really depends on, on your finance type and what you're doing. Because if you're going in and you get an FHA loan with 3.5% down, and you're putting in minimal money, you know, I know a guy that got a property with a VA loan, he brought like 1300 bucks to the closing, and he's making 1500 bucks a month on that property. So that's a pretty good cash on cash return. I don't know what the number is, but it's probably a thousand percent plus. Sometimes you can't just take that into account, but it is a really good thing to look at. There's a lot of metrics out there. The important part isn't the metrics you use. Well, it is, right, because you don't want to use certain things. You don't want to use the bankruptcy method for cash flow calculation <laughs> <Yeah>. and determine <coughs> how to invest in property. But the, the property has to work for you, and you have to know what work for you means. Once you figure all that out, you get on automatic updates with your agent. And every time something that meets your criteria, at least on the surface, 
it will uh, comes on the market, or goes off the market, will pop through on your email on whatever frequency you choose, daily, weekly, every 15 minutes. That'll probably get really annoying. And then the next part, which I'm also going to drive home pretty good, is that uh, it's important not to delay. The second a good deal comes through, do not delay it. Get the offer done faster than everybody else. Get in there faster than everybody else. Sometimes you can get a property way below what it's worth if you're way ahead of everybody and you're aggressive about it in certain ways. Tell them how fast we miss deals. We miss them all the time. Yeah. Within an hour, we put the offer and we didn't even get to the property yet and we're out. Yeah, we didn't even get in the property and we're already out. Yep. <coughs> Guys, when I, when I see a good deal come through the market, I have a lot of clients that I work with. I'm a real estate broker. So sometimes I'll see a property, I got a client that called me right away, I didn't even know this thing exists, it's already under contract with my client, right? And then all my other clients call me tomorrow. And they're like, hey, can we get into this property? I'm like, too late, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens all the time. And we miss deals constantly, because we're not always the fastest ones we try to be, but it's, it's hard to be the absolute fastest. And you gotta be constantly looking. Um, so yeah, you must make an offer faster than anyone else. Maybe you see it first, maybe you just drop the offer, but get into the mix fast and hard, get it under contract. Okay. There's some sources for off-market deals. It's going to take more time, effort, energy to get these off-market deals than it would to just go to an agent and have a look at the MLS. Um, and certain ways of doing it are better than others. So the first one we want to talk about is wholesalers. Is there any wholesalers in the room? Right there. Just one. Okay, I expected more. But uh, so wholesalers, you got to be careful with them. Right? Because a lot of times the wholesalers are new to real estate. They don't know exactly what they're doing. That's usually the first step that people take. They just don't know that they're not giving a great deal. Um, so in many cases, they have little no experiences themselves. In other cases, they, be less than, they may be less than honorable. Um, there are wholesalers out there that have really bad reputations. Some of them, you know exactly who they are if you've been in real estate for any amount of time. I see people shaking their heads yes. I think they, uh, they know some of the people we're talking about. Um, and in some rare cases, there are decent people that know their stuff at wholesale. In particular, I want to mention one property that a buddy of mine, Steve, over there bought from a wholesaler um, on November 30th, 2017 for 70,000. He, uh, he fixed that thing up for pretty short money, something like 25 grand. He resold it for 205, seven months later roughly. Uh, it was a really good deal from a wholesaler. The guy took a $10,000 fee, but he set it up front. He said, this is a great deal. It's set under contract for 70,000. I want 10 grand and it's yours. And Steve cut him a check for 10 grand and got the building. And he does, he's a flipper himself in a different area of New Hampshire. Yeah. So he was the type of guy that would have done it himself except it was far away from his house. They have to be close to mine. Right. And sometimes wholesalers aren't just people that are wholesalers. Sometimes wholesalers are investors that have seven deals going on and one comes across their desk and it's a great deal, but they just can't do it, can't handle it. I think with the wholesalers, like, especially if they're flippers also, is like understanding if they're wholesaling, what their motivation is. Oh yeah. Why they're doing it, I mean, with anything else. But it's Reasonability to, you know. Yeah, because sometimes it's the cheapest deal they got, right? And they just want right. to They, they have too much on their plate, like, or whatever it might be. Or sometimes they really are just, they got construction work going on in all seven places. And somebody comes to them and says, hey, I talked to you three months ago about this house, now I want to sell it. And they're like, shit, I can't even buy this. I don't have any money left. I got to wholesale exactly. this. So it really depends on the wholesaler, who they are and what their situation is. But with them, you have to verify everything. With anybody, really. Even on the MLS. Versus the guy on Facebook saying, hey, this wonderful wholesale deal, he's really just a marketing guy in disguise. He's just trying to sell the spread is what he's trying to do. Okay, so another way of finding deals is networking. Just talking to people you know and you deal with on a regular basis can get you deals by contractors or friends. Even the mailman. Mm -hmm. Mailman is actually a guy that goes and sees neighborhoods. Probably a good guy to talk to. You know, give him a, a card. Um, maybe offer to you know, buy him lunch or do something nice for him if he gets you a house or maybe something better than that. I don't know. Um, I actually got a pretty good deal from an electrician that worked for me. And I partnered up with my buddy Steve on that one, but we bought it at, uh, it was a two family on Forestdale Road in Worcester. We bought it with the intention of holding it as a rental. We paid 163000 but we got 2500 back. 
We bought it on uh, January 29th this year, and we resold it this year, October 26th through 70. We didn't put that much work into it. Um, the market just appreciated, so we we resold it. And we got pretty good money back, and uh, we gave the electrician with rental in between. Yeah, we gave the electrician a two thousand dollar consulting fee to say thank you. And how's that deal? What would that sell for if the market didn't appreciate? Uh, I don't. We would have made Probably. it sell for two seventy. Honestly, the, the, the day we bought it, <laughs> the day we bought it, it was worth about three forty. Yeah. It didn't appreciate that much, um, but it appreciated more. And we listed this thing for two forty nine nine. It went for two seventy because we had a lot of activity. So yeah, it was yeah. a good one. Big. It was a big two family, very large. Very large. Uh, seven bedrooms in one unit, five in the other. Huge. Big. Yeah. 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 Two family. And living room, dining room, all that other stuff. Fire was big. So, next one is direct mail and banded signs. I don't know if you guys have seen those yellow letters, um, <coughs> handwritten letters, all that stuff. Uh, I do these direct mail campaigns myself sometimes. They've been less fruitful lately than they have been in the past. I think uh, people are really beating the shit out of those lists. There's probably five guys in here right now sending the same people letters that I sent. Um, but if you have really good narrowed down lists, you can still get some good deals sometimes. The reason I continue to do them more than anything is because I'm a real estate broker and we list some of these properties. But when people are not willing to pay what an investor would pay, because you or I, everybody in this room, shouldn't pay full market for any property. That's not what an investor does. If you're out paying full market, you know, um, you're not going to go very far. What percentage do you offer of the full market? It really depends on the deal. It has to make sense for my numbers. You know, in some cases, it's hundred thousand dollars less than what they're asking. In fact, we bought a building that's two hundred thousand dollars below what they were asking. A nine-unit building, in, uh, well, nine-unit set building in Worcester on Townsend, which is one of the deals we're going to talk about in a minute. I have some examples at the end. Oh, it really, really depends on the deal. And they did that because they took the cap rate and did it reverse. So if someone asks for a price, and we know what the cap rate should be in that particular zip code, then we can tell you what the price of the building should be as a performing instrument. Forget about what he's asking for, so that's the price you have to ask. Because once I take over those tenants, guess what I'm going to get for a rate of return? That cap rate, you know what I mean? So here's the important stuff, right? If you guys decide to put out bandit signs, you decide to do direct mail, um, you have to have a quality list, but the answer is a really important thing, right? You gotta answer the phone. When I go driving around, I see bandit signs at Home Depot and stuff, right? I call them because they might be a wholesaler with a decent deal. They never fucking answer the phone. They never call me back. Why do they put out the signs? I have no idea. Same thing with these direct mail things, right? When you have enough problems, you're gonna start getting these things in the mail saying, hey, I'll buy your house, right? You call them up and you're like, I got this letter from you. I got this property, this address. Call me back. They never call you again. You never get a call back. I don't know why they spent their money. So stupid, right? So if you're one of those people that's never going to call them back, and you're wasting your money mailing, maybe hire a, mail, uh, a phone answering company like uh, Pat Live or something like that. There's a lot of companies out there that just answer the phone. You get a specific phone number linked just to them, and they answer the phone and say, hey, uh, Pat Live, for example, whether it's a guy or a girl, on the other end, they say, hi, thank you for calling this. This is Pat speaking, or whatever your business name is. And they take your script that you give them and answer the phone and ask exactly those questions. And then you can still fail to get back to them if you want. A lot of people <laughs> probably still do that. But if you actually get back to them, that's probably the best way to do business. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest keys. So this is going to touch on something we talked about briefly before. You have to look at a lot of properties to buy a good deal. This is what's called the deal plumbing. This is just an example. Um, but basically, you want to look at properties that meet the basic criteria, and then you go ahead and you analyze them. I use the bigger pockets calculator. I know some people think it's not the greatest thing in the world. I believe when you're estimating the performance of a property, you should keep it simple because I don't know to the penny what a property's going to make until I'm running it. In fact, I don't even know what it's going to make after I'm running it. My accountant does. Um, but you'll likely have to pursue hundreds of properties before you end up buying the one that fits your criteria. In some cases, out of every hundred properties you see, one's probably worth offering on. And by see, I mean see online, not, not going out. I mean, go to 500 properties and you make a one offer, probably wasting a lot of time. It's not a good idea, but 
I'm talking about things that come across your desk, things that come in the updates, things that people talk, tell you about or ask you about. Um, you just have to be clear up front what you're looking for and know your strategy and then go through this process. You get your basic criteria, you see if the numbers work on paper. If they do, you do a walkthrough of the property. If you can, if you can't, you just make a freaking offer. Uh, depends on the situation. Uh, you'll do your final analysis after you do the walkthrough. Now you have what's called a rehab budget. Um, maybe you used a home inspector, maybe you were smarter and you used a contractor instead. Um, who could actually tell you more and doesn't charge you what a home inspector charges you. Um, maybe you use a home inspector anyway, I don't know. Um, after you got the offer in, if you get the offer accepted, you buy it, you close the deal, and then you're done, you move on to the next one. Um, there's a lot of different strategies. So on the bottom line, you know your strategy. I'll touch on this briefly. Some people just send out blind low balls, 20 of them. They send their agent a list saying, uh, 354 Kimball, 12,000. Um, 7 Mott Street, 184,000. And then just give them the list of addresses and offer amounts. And these agents will get up all these offers and blast them off to all these agents and piss them off at the low ball. But some of them will stick, some of them will start negotiating, and you might get a deal out of that. Very aggressive way to do it. It's a lot of work for whoever's actually sending it to the office. What's the Probably, probably one to five percent, somewhere in there. Blind low balls. Now, doesn't mean if you send out twenty blind low balls, you probably won't buy any of the properties in that list. But you may get a few negotiated. You may be able to work them down with some properties each other deal. That's just one technique. Some people like to just go out and look at properties all the see them all. Uh, I don't think that's a good way to do it. If you go try to see every property in the market, you're probably wasting a lot of time. Um, there's a lot of other ways to do it, knocking on doors, whatever. I'm just kind of know what your strategy is and get into that. All right, so next step to due diligence. Once you have your property under contract, you gotta make sure it's actually worth buying. There's a lot of issues that can come up with a property. You could have bad plumbing underground. You could have bad electrical system and find out after you bought the house. You could have all types of issues that you don't you don't know, realize, or see until you've had the experience or if you've had the right person in there. So if you have an experienced contractor in there, they can tell you most of the issues. If you have a home inspector in there, they can tell you that there's a problem, but I don't know exactly how to fix it or what it is, and I can't advise you. Um, but at least you'll know there's some sort of problem. So you have to have somebody that has some clue as to what they're doing. Go through the property before you buy it. You have to go to the Board of Health, the building department, check for open violations, uh, check for previous permits, see if work was done without permits. Sometimes you go in there and you see the plumbing is a butcher job, right? It's disgusting. And you know they didn't put permits because the inspector was issued a thing. So, <laughs> so you go to the building department and you're like, hey, we well, have a plumbing permit. And they're like, nothing. And you're like, I knew it. And you can use that for negotiating. But if you don't know what bad plumbing looks like versus good plumbing, you can't really use it for negotiating. You're gonna have somebody there that knows all that. Um, so I think I just talked about this, right? Open permits, closed permits, inspecting the property. You can do a traditional home inspection, walk through with contractors, bring experienced friend or fellow investor, or a combination of these. Uh, when I was starting out in Worcester, I brought my buddy Steve with me on a lot of property uh, walkthroughs. <coughs> And we learned a lot, well I learned a lot, he's, he's seen it all for a long time. We, we went through and we saw some stuff. He pointed out things, my dad's a GC, he, he runs my construction side of my business right now. He goes and sees all my properties before I buy them. I do inspections because I have a GC on staff. And we um, do this very fast. This isn't like deal saw it in, it's open No, it's days. Right, it's days. You know, we're in and out of there very quick. Usually when the building's crumbling, you can tell very quickly you're in there. You know you have specialized individuals to get in there, but it's not something you send over five, ten days, it's pretty fast. Once you've done all this, you're gonna confirm your numbers. A lot of that includes confirming rent amounts. So when you go into a building with tenants, there's a list of questions I like to ask tenants. Agents hate it, the owner hates it, everybody hates it but us. And sometimes we're standing there and we find out the owner lied to us, right? So you know, how much is your rent? How long have you lived here? How long has your rent been that amount? Because sometimes they raise it just before you get in there and the people are like, listen, 
they, my rent's actually not even increased yet. It's going to be increased in the first of next month when I'm moving because of that. Right? That's an yeah. important key thing, right? Regular. <clears throat> Is there any problems with the plumbing? Any water leak anywhere? Is there any electrical? When you plug certain things in certain places, do you have issues? The breaker strip, right? Those are important questions to ask. Um, if you ask all those questions to the tenants, you'll get a better idea of what's going on in the building, the tenants, the property manager, everybody you can ask. Hold nothing back, because when you don't ask those questions, and then you find out after the closing, that's the worst time to find out. Because um, you can lower the price. Yeah. Oh, I've had issues recently where I had a building that we uh, we got, six units, four were uh, fully occupied, four were occupied, two were vacant, and the owner told us that they had last month's rents on four of those four apartments, three of the four apartments, right? They weren't last month's rents, they were security deposits. Very different when you end up in an eviction court with a tenant. When you have a mishandled security deposit, you can be liable for triple damages. And even if you bought the building, the tenant gets protected, not you. So you take on that liability for triple damages. So what we did was we gave them all back yeah, through the tenants. Right. And we had them sign a document releasing us of liability on the advice of our attorney. But we found that out afterward. We, we, didn't, we, we didn't get estoppel certificates from every tenant because the seller refused to do that. Probably because they were being deceitful. That's what they were telling us. They probably knew the difference. Uh, but the owner signed an estoppel saying that they were last month's rent. So if we do end up getting down to the nitty gritty, we could probably sue the old owner, but it's not worth it. Right? I, I don't know. Uh, but it, it sucked to find that out afterwards. You gotta ask all the right questions. And even if you do sometimes, you still find out afterwards that it's not the right not the right answers. So buy it. This is the next step. When you're buying a property, your attorney is going to be a key player there. I have an attorney named Brandy. She's awesome. She keeps track of all our deadlines. She keeps track of everything, the deposits. She helps negotiate the PNS. She explains things to me. She explains things to my clients when I'm, when I'm in, working as an agent or a broker. Um, and a good attorney makes all the difference in the world. If you have, there's some attorneys that are, are shitty because they never respond. There are some attorneys that are shitty because they're what's called deal killers. They always find some reason to kill the deal. There's some attorneys that don't understand investing. They don't know what a private loan is. They don't know what a seller holdback is. They don't know any of this stuff, right? They're just traditional, I close, first time home buyer, um, FHA loans all day long. That's the wrong attorney. It's just as important as picking your uh, agent. Hopefully if you pick the right agent, they'll have the right attorney ready for you. Um, but a, a bad attorney can really hold up your deals, can cost you money, can cost you time, can kill your deals. You can, you can lose good deals. And once you've put down deposits, once you've paid for inspections, whether they be with your contractor or your home inspector, whatever it is, once you've, you've put time and effort into it, you're gonna lose if the deal dies. And sometimes it's just because the attorney shitty. Two things, Mike. It's also ruins your reputation. Oh, yes. If you're moving into this area. And the second, person that you talk about, do you recommend to have her? Oh, sure, yeah, just email me. I'll get you. I use on the lending side, too, because she's very yeah. efficient. She's a traveling attorney, so she goes to no, you don't use the closing area. area. Yeah. I think I say that somewhere. Yeah, in the, yeah. In the yeah. yeah no divorce yeah. attorney. Yeah. 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 All three. Oh, yes, no divorce attorney. Yeah. Jack of all trades. You don't want some attorney that does everything? Right. You don't want some attorney that bills three hundred fifty dollars hourly to do a real estate transaction. You want a per per transaction fee that's flat from a good attorney that does real estate transactional attorney. Um, if everything works out well, you can go to the place and get the keys to your new place. That's when the real work begins, unless you want a turnkey. So, what a turnkey property is is something that's already running good. All you do is buy and flip the rents. It's been ran well by some buyer. As investors, we're probably not going to be targeting that. I don't know how many people in here are looking for turnkey. Hopefully, it's not a, a lot of hands, but uh, it might be a good way to start. And once you get into investing, if you want to have real value built in from day one, you can't buy turnkey. It just doesn't work. So, after the buy, now it's time to get the property running the way you like it. 
It may take some time and help to get it there, but the reason you bought it was for income. You must now rent and collect on the units, which is easier said than done. Finding tenants can be tough. Managing tenants can be tough. Sometimes they break shit and blame it on you and complain and complain, or, you know, there, there are a lot of things that go wrong when you have a tenant in place, your water tank blows, right? Hopefully it's in the basement when that happens. If it's not, that gets really bad. Um, so this is another area where a good team comes into play. You're gonna need contractors and vendors, you're gonna need plumbers, you're gonna need electricians, you're gonna need uh, handymen, you're gonna need all types of people after you buy the property. You're gonna need to know what your accounting looks like. If you're not good at that, I recommend you outsource to a bookkeeper, right? Um, if you use the right agent, they should have the contacts for all these people. They should be able to help you out. If that agent was an investor in your area, they use the same contractors anyway, right? Um, so that is key. And that's another reason doing things right from the beginning helps you after you bought the property. Um, and you must always be planning for the next one. Time to start the process again and get another income producing asset. Sometimes they find you. That Sometimes happens. they do find you. Once you, right. get a little more, uh, once you get a little more experience and time and you built a name for yourself, people come to you with deals. Uh, so I've got some examples for you guys. These are all recent uh, recent deals. So this is a property at 31 Prospect Street, Webster. Um, this is a client of mine, a buddy of mine, and actually a guy that used to run this meetup before, Eric. I don't know if you guys know him, but this is one of his acquisitions. Uh, he bought this property at a six family in Webster. The thing's really nice inside, in my opinion. If, if you want to look at it with an untrained eye, it'd be awful, but it, it's got a really nice sprinkler system. It's probably got a $25,000 electrical service. It's brand new on the outside of the building. Um, it, it's, it's pretty good shape for $101,000. I think it was a great deal. I don't have the, the uh, analysis on this because this was a my particular purchase, but I assume that it's probably about $6,000 in monthly rent on a $101,000 purchase. That's, uh, I don't know, a year and a half to get your entire purchase price back yes. in rent, so Perfect. not so bad. But it's Webster. Yes. But it's so Jefferson right here, this is the one I was talking about with the units that uh, the security deposits were mixed up. Yeah. were represented to us as last month's rent by the previous owners. So it's a six why, why, why is that? Why is that wrong? Why is the security deposit as uh, Oh, because when you end up in the housing pool, we, we actually are evicting everybody. In the building, right? Yeah. Uh, if you have an improperly handled last month's rent, and I'm not an attorney, the camera. <laughs> if you have an improperly handled last month's rent, it's not subject to what's called triple damages, right? Treble. Treble. Yeah. Or, yeah. So if you have a thousand dollar last month's rent, it's, it's mishandled. You owe them interest, basically, for the past six years plus the last month's rent back, right? If it's a thousand dollars, interest at five percent, fifty bucks a year, three hundred dollars, you owe thirteen hundred, right? That's not the case in security deposits. It could be travel damages plus the interest. So thousand becomes forty three hundred bucks. And then you have to pay this person back. And on top of that, people lose court cases right. over three dollars and thirteen cents in interest that they didn't properly pay to the tenant. So but if it's let alone the bigger number. But if it's mishandled if you haven't given the interest back to the tenant. So there are a ton of rules about the security deposit. If you don't follow every one of them, exactly, it's mishandled. Right, but this is the previous owner, so that wouldn't be his owners. That's why they have a stop on certificates. That's what puts the punctuation point to what the previous guy did versus what you're doing. But he didn't have a stop from the actual tenants. Even if, you, even if you do, right, it's still a tenant-friendly state, right? right yeah. The courts still want to protect the tenant more than the landlord. Even if the tenant's some evil monster. The devil could be living in one of your apartments, and the, the state will be like, this devil guy is a victim here. I know you always, always, always take a stopple. So you're posting a property and then you're tenants. Not always viable, but you're right. And you know, when I sell like some of my them. properties, I'm very hesitant to have a stopple on tenants because a lot of times I don't want the tenant to know that I'm really selling the property until it's really, really sold. Right. These deals can float quite a while then die two days before the closing. Mm -hmm. So now you've spooked my tenants with all these estoppel letters they were signed. They automatically assume, hey, I gotta leave now. The new landlord's gonna throw me out or jack the rent up. And so now you fall apart at your closing, you don't buy my building and I'm left with three pissed off tenants. So that's one of the reasons why I'm hesitant on everybody barging into the tenants and getting them to sign scary documents to them. 
this particular building was owned by four or five siblings, and they hated the place. They didn't want to ever see it again for the rest of their life. And the thought of them going in to talk to a tenant to get an estoppel studio was unbelievable. They couldn't even consider it. Um, was basically how they put it. it to me. <laughs> when we asked to do a final walkthrough, the guy almost shit his pants. He started screaming. We were at we were at a showing, and I said, "Hey, a couple days before closing, we want to come back and see Make this sure place again." That almost killed the deal right then. We never got a final walkthrough. It didn't happen. Yeah. Guy wasn't willing to let it happen. Uh, but anyway, it's six units. Um, I believe it's actually three two bedrooms, a three bedroom, and two one bedrooms. But we got the analysis on the next page. It was sold for three hundred thousand on October 29th. So very recently. Um, it's not less property here. It, it was an Everless property, yes. The previous one was also an Everless property too. So this is a, a good testament to the fact that the MLS isn't dead. You can still get a good deal on MLS, but on both of these properties we were the fastest. And how fast were they, they from the day of listing? What'd you say? Within a day. Right. Just so you guys have an idea. What do you mean, really fresh? This was listed, uh, that one was listed, uh, mislisted, by the way, as a five family. And it was uh, it was misrepresented in a lot of ways. The agent was not very good. So it was listed like 325, 330, something like that. We did 300. Private. We used a private loan. And then we're fixing it up, kicking all the tenants out that are. They're all awful, like, you Pitbull know. Pitbull Central. Pitbull Central, yeah. Class X, you know what I mean? There was one apartment I went into in this place on the first floor in the front building. There's two buildings, one in the front, one in the back. You'll see that very commonly in Worcester. I went in there, and there's this raging pitbull. I couldn't <laughs> see it, but I could hear it. It's like ripping like the walls balls. off the house, barking. You can hear it hitting the fucking walls. I, my heart's beating like crazy. I'm a little afraid of dogs, Just especially when they're racing the right? And, uh, and I'm walking into the kitchen, I look over, and there's this little wooden baby gate with glass kind of holding oh, that dog God. back. So I told my dad, I'm like, get the fuck out of here right now. We're leaving this apartment. We left. We didn't finish seeing that thing. The thing was so big and aggressive. We just got out of the apartment. Why do you think the other guy didn't want to do the one? Yeah. Yeah, no, it was bad. Um, there, was a, there was a little toddler in there, like two months, three months ago. Like, you're talking about the eviction costs a little bit, but like, were there no leases in place? Like, they're all tenant wills, and you can just go and get There's uh, documentation on one unit of the four, and the uh, one unit that had documentation is uh, it's a couple, two guys, and they're very cooperative, certain 30 day notice. They're very politely said, Hey, we're going to leave, and thank you for the uh, thank you for giving us notice. And we're, we're very nice and polite. Can we use our last month's rent or security deposit or whatever it is for the last month? And I said, I just have to have you sign a document. Yep. Brought to them, they signed it, and they said they'll be out by the end of this month. And I believe that. The other ones, are, you know, you go through the whole process. Oh, yeah. Pitbull yeah. people are the worst. Um, worst attitude, too. Worst really attitude. Good I have one tenant that is like, they're people, they're people, they're people yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what it is. And lately, I've been bombarded with these fucking service people. People move in, no dog. All of a sudden, there's a pit bull in the apartment. They got a certificate from their doctor and a service. Yep. service. This is an emotional angle, support monster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> service support monster. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, how do you how do you deal with this? I mean, you like, can't. There's nothing you can do. It's, like, it's, it's so difficult. Yeah, without you. Nothing you can do about the emotional support. So animals. I'm about, you know, like I'm about to charge five percent of the rent uh, for the pit bull. Better be careful. I don't know if that's permitted. Yeah. I don't think if it's if it's emotional support, you cannot do that. But if it's just a pit bull, I will be clear with you, Andres. If I have a, a five by building and they got a dog in it, a friendly little Chihuahua, huge pit bull, I immediately move to a victim. We don't discriminate on species of the dogs. The second I buy the building. Their introduction to me is their 30-day notice to quit. No, that is how they did. That's how they find out someone bought the building. So the people that have the Chihuahuas, they all have uh, leases. So that's a little bit difficult. To yeah. yeah, that sucks. As soon as you possibly can, give them a boot. Yeah, once the lease is expired. Yeah, once the lease is expired. So can you not reject tenants with emotional Technically, technically, no. People reject them for other reasons, though. Yes, even though you have an open policy, nobody in the 
Well, the uniformly applied. Yeah, yeah, as long as the uniformly applied. You get, you get, you get, you find another way. Usually they're yeah. small, so, okay, so what is that? They don't have enough excess capital to run the department on the back of the law. Is that a you know what I mean? So if you think email, you say, no. Well, you, you can't just yeah, people without any Maybe you forget. I don't know. That's on you. It is. It is my It is my problem. We don't have any time. It won't be able to take Oh, by the way, my daughter, you know, she used to have this pit bull, and her dog yeah, but makes, it makes her feel that. nice. Yeah. So they don't let us. I just have to wait in New York. Yeah. But you know what? You laugh. Sometimes you just don't have to have the dog. You just have to be here. It's always been all right sometimes. I love my dog. Sometimes the dog isn't the problem. It's the people. No, I love my dog. All right, guys, let's focus. We're almost done, okay? Okay. All right. So that was just one example. Things that make pretty good money. There's a 177 cap at the purchase based on our numbers. And pro forma means after we've done all the remodeling, fixed everything up. Uh, we should be performing at a 10.84 cap, 11 cap roughly. Probably do better than that because I doubt we're going to use $101,000 on the rehab and, and, the, and the acquisition. But yeah, I, know, uh, I guess we'll find out when we're done. Uh, another one is 47 Pleasant Street, Leicester. This is a five family. Uh, so it's got a three bed, three two beds, and a one bedroom. This is one of my favorite buildings in the world. Recently bought that for 340. These fucking tenants, we bought the thing fully vacant, but didn't need that much work. It needed minimal work. These tenants mail their rent checks and they're they're at our office on the first. Every one of them. No bullshit from that. That's not Worcester. Not Worcester. No. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like heaven coming into the office on the first and signing all their checks. Wonderful. Um, so I thought that was a great deal based on that. Are there deals like that anymore? Yeah. That was a recent purchase. That's July. That's recent. That's recent. Uh, it's actually, I think that's a good one. That was a bad weather. I think we can actually push a little bit now. MLS on that one again. Was that MLS, Mike? That was an MLS deal, yeah. Okay. Well, how many days on before you bought it? I don't know. That one wasn't as quick. Those areas outside of Worcester don't move as fast. I think it was on the market for a few weeks before I ended up buying it. Once you get to five units, though, all these conventionals and FHAs are all out of the mix. Yeah. So it's a different world. Yes. Huh? What was it listed at? I have no idea. Probably closer to 400. What was it listed for, the Pleasant Street one before? Uh, 380 maybe? Yeah, 370 or 375 maybe. I can't remember that. This was a 1031 exchange, by the way. I'm not going to get into that now. It's a little more complicated, but I sold a building, a three decker, and 1031 into this. Um, but the cap rate, 9.43 pro forma, but the reality is we didn't spend anywhere near what we thought we'd spend in our rehab budget. Well, actually, we probably did. It was only 20 grand, right? And that's an excellent cap yeah. rate for that zip code. Yeah, no, and, and this is like a headache for the cap rate. Right, so it's like the burden free zone, so the cap rate's a Like little checks lower. in the mail. No, no crap from tenants. They don't complain much. Um, yeah, it's totally different. Couldn't be more different. I'll take a nine cap and less for any day. Okay. This is a good one. This right here is nine through fifteen thousand Street. We have a couple of people in this room that may have invested in this. We took some investors uh, on and partners here. This is nine units. It's three units there, three units there, and three units in the back. We paid three hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars for this nine-unit deal. It was on the market for uh, five seventy, something like that. Five fifty-five, five seventy-five. Um, we get over two hundred thousand dollars off. Um, yeah, we did pretty good. Steve's recommendation was to offer three thirty-five, and they came back with a counter at three fifty-five, and we were like, okay. But there's a reason. Oh, okay. They came back to the price in a certain sense and pays for this cap for that particular zone. This, it's a job. This thing, there was a group showing. It was a great deal by, by most standards, 570000 for nine minutes. It's usually a good deal in Worcester, right? Me and Eric went there, and there was about a dozen groups, right? Some of these units, me and Eric walked through the door. One other guy that's a, a pretty major investor that's a buddy of ours walked through the door. Everybody else stopped and left. This completely left the site. 
There was units where a guy sleeps on a mattress on the floor and pisses right next to his bed, doesn't use his bathroom, shits on the floor in his bedroom. <laughs> and not overnight, like for months on it. Yeah. Oh, God. Shits yeah. right on the this bedroom. Floor. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah. That was not the worst unit. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's actually a nice neighborhood. Like the walls. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Oh, yeah. Pretty bad. Oh, yeah. In this building. Huh? This isn't the hood, actually. This is right off the Park Avenue. Yeah. Yeah. This is a nice area. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of nice area. Yeah. Worst, worst houses yeah. on that street. Yeah. I thought. Yeah. 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 Oh, my guy in his 80s that just didn't give a shit anymore. Yeah. 15 years, 20 years of deferred maintenance and shitty management. Shitty bars. I don't even water you mean. Yeah. We're in the basement. It's the first place you see, like, ripping through. That's so gross. Oh, the guy puts out his cigarettes in his public vest. So this is going to use it for me. Uh, there's no such way. Except in the building of the house. There's an audience. Our rehab budget is $175,000. We have not put in that much yet. We're still in the project. This was an acquisition of... <laughs> Let's go back to slide. That was the other reason I said you got to dig it. I know what the acquisition rate was. Yeah, across three buildings. He's got jobs, or he's just got jobs? It's just about the closest you can get to a gut job. We bought it on uh, 827.18. We just went through housing court with six of the nine tenants. Uh, we were only going to evict from two buildings. One of the buildings was in much better shape, so we decided to keep those people. We're now evicting one of them because they're shitty rent payers. So we end up evicting seven of the nine, but we're clearing two of the buildings. Um, but but about three months ago, we are still working on getting people out. The last people from housing court, we agreed to let them stay till February 28th. Uh, the guy lives on the second floor, has no legs, he's an amputee, he's in a wheelchair. So we had to give him a lot of time. Yes. You would think he'd want to move anyway. Yeah. These people have like three hundred seventy-five dollar rent for two bedrooms. So. You know, legs or not, most people would stay, right? <laughs> is that it? Yeah. All right, guys. So I think that's the end of it. I'm happy to answer any questions now. I know we kind of answered some as we went. Um, my contact info is all up on the screen. If you want copies of this presentation, if you want to email me for, uh, I don't know, contact information for attorneys, whatever, I'm happy to help. Um, and I'll answer any questions right now.